Well, as uh, Sheva introduced me, uh, uh, you get the impression that uh, I'm uh, maybe a few years older than a lot of you, but uh, even though this picture shows a very young me, I enjoy getting up every day and going to work at our research farm. And uh, it's one of the highlights of my retirement, being busy and, and doing uh, a project such as we've worked with uh, Advanced Ag. We, uh, our business, our research farm is right outside of Lethbridge here. Uh, during the summer or during our uh, season, we have uh, 14 people working out there. A uh, couple of research uh, managers that have been with me for, uh, for many years, one 15 years. So we got a great amount of experience and we do uh, a fair number of research trials out on our research farm here in uh, various uh, areas such as uh, Sheva talked about in the introduction, fungicides, herbicides. Uh, my background, uh, or, well, as well as uh, variety trials, my background goes back uh, uh, many years. Uh, uh, I worked with Monsanto for uh, 28 some odd years in research and development. I also worked at the Agriculture Canada Research Station here in Lethbridge uh, for a number of years before uh, retiring from Monsanto and uh, then getting busy on my own business. So, so we've uh, we've been operating for nearly 20 years at our research site right outside of Lethbridge. Just to really highlight, uh, we 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 are not associated with Advanced Ag. We do our work for them under a contract. Uh, they. Uh, the supply is funds to do the, the contract uh, work with a protocol uh, that we agree on that would be most beneficial. So we've been working with Advanced Ag and Josh uh, for three years, actually introduced by uh, Scott Walker. Uh, uh, so Scotty had to come all the way from Winnipeg to introduce us here in Lethbridge uh, three years ago. Anyway, that's my coordinates. If you uh, have any interest in contacting us, uh, uh, that's my email address uh, to is the best contact. Okay. Uh, I should be able to move that slide. Uh, Sheva, did I not? Uh, you should be able to just click, Bill, and then there will be a, a slight delay, but uh, if you okay. just click that, yeah. it's right there, you should switch slides. There you go. Okay, there, good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> awesome. Definition of biostimulants, 2018. A couple of these slides I got from Robert uh, Chambers. Uh, he presented uh, on this very uh, subject at uh, the Farm Forum back a couple of months ago in Saskatoon. And you can see on the left-hand side there, we'll just concentrate on that. The definition, the official regulatory definition in the United States. And uh, Scott Walker will talk about what's happening here in Canada with that definition when he talks a little later. So, so we look at a plant biostimulant is a substance or microorganism that when applied to seeds, plants, or the rhizosphere stimulates natural processes to enhance or benefit nutrient uptake, nutrient efficiency, tolerance to abiotic stress, crop quality and yield. And certainly when we're, when we're talking about the ACF uh, blend of uh, bacteria that's going on the soil, we're talking really about how in the soil it is going to affect the nutrient uptake and the nutrient efficiency, which ultimately is going to lend, uh, lead to uh, the other attributes that we may be looking at. We're not going to go into the uh, European definition. It's pretty much the same, uh, only a little wordier. Than, than the uh, United States definition of uh, plant biostimulant. Just I wanted to also use this slide because when we talk about biostimulants, where are we gonna target the plant? How are we gonna deliver it to the plant? And that upstairs canopy of a plant uh, is very resistant to letting things get in. It doesn't mind carbon dioxide getting in and letting moisture out through the leaves, but it has developed over, over millions, hundreds of millions of years to resist any penetration by outside, uh, by outside influences, especially bacteria. Keep the bacteria and the fungus out is what the plant wants to do so it can grow and do its thing. <clears throat> so 
when we try and get stuff into the plant, the foliage up there, then we have to consider things like surfactants to be able to help with the penetration, which of course is all the science with uh, herbicides and fungicides and insecticides and penetration uh, into the plant so that we have a systemic action. When we're talking the ACF SR product, we of course are talking apply onto the soil, getting into that soil, to have it do its job there as that biostimulant and releasing of nutrients. So I like to use this little uh, little uh, caption. Our soil is a cauldron of living organisms. And I heard John refer to the term witch's brew, which I think is, is actually in Macbeth. But here's a, a wording that I've changed a little bit. Cauldron, cauldron, boil and bubble. Cauldron microbes toil on stubble. So apologies to you, William Shakespeare. But really when we think about that soil, that, uh, that huge soil biome down there, the first thing we're gonna do is deliver our stubble, the leftover plant residue onto that soil. And we want microorganisms to, to start to work on that, that stubble, that plant residue to break it down completely, putting some of it into organic matter but to break it down so that nutrients from that stubble or from that crop residue will recycle and get into a nutrient form that can be picked up by the new growth of plants. So we know, of course, in that, that cauldron of soil, in that soil biome, we have hundreds of thousands of species of bacteria, hundreds of thousands of species of fungi. Many are beneficial. And of course, we need, we need those microorganisms to break down the, the straw and the, the material that we return to the soil, it's essential to the recycling of the nutrients. So sometimes those darn little microorganisms get working when we haven't harvested the plant and then we have what's called a disease. So we certainly do wanna get the, uh, uh, get the plant material broken down to recycle the nutrients. Just about all of our elements or nutrients that the plant picks up in the root is taken in in an ionic form, a positive cation or a negative anion. Species we know will increase in number, different bacteria will increase in number or fungi and then fall off. So environment really means everything to a bug. And when I say bug, I'm talking about our microorganisms, our micro bugs. And when you think about it, okay, I can understand that when crop rotation, if I grow canola, 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 I am creating an environment where the fungal organisms that are responsible for black leg or sclerotinia will bring, continue to build up. So all of a sudden I have a devastated canola crop. So that is something to keep in mind that, that we know that, that uh, microorganisms will increase in numbers and then decrease off, again, depending on the environment. And I think uh, John alluded to that pretty nicely in, in some of the stuff they're doing with, with the brewing of the, uh, of the material. One other thing that I found really interesting, and this would be of interest to some of you farmers, is that uh, at our Canada Weed Science Society meeting a year and a half ago in Kelowna, there was a microbiologist from Washington State uh, University, I think, uh, came up and talked. And he was a microbiologist and he talked about the, the situation where you have volunteer grain coming in the spring, growing volunteer wheat, and you have to spray that out. And you go in and you spray it with Roundup, for example. And then as that material uh, breaks down, there's an increase in pythium in that soil. So that pythium can increase, and then all of a sudden you go in and, and direct seed into that, that area. Now you could have an influence where the new seedling is being attacked by pythium. So these cycles of bacteria and microorganisms increasing and decreasing is going on all the time. Environment means everything to a bug. Plants have been living in a symbiotic relationship with bacteria forever. Uh, few hundred million years ago, bacteria is consi are considered to have invaded plant cells. And from there, those little organelles, those bacteria became mitochondria, the energy powerhouse of, the, of, a, of a cell. Or they may be entered and they, that little organelle became a coroplast, which of course is within a plant cell, that green material comes from the coroplast with the chlorophyll and able to produce 
the photosynthates that are so critical to, to plant growth. Consider also that the nitrogen cycle is run by bacteria, good and bad. We have rhizobium, nitrosomonas, and nitrobacter. And you, those are two of the, the bacteria that uh, we're introducing in the soil with the ACF. Uh, they are naturally occurring as well, critical for the conversion of ammonium to nitrate. We have denitrifying bacteria. And I say, ouch, to that, as under anaerobic conditions, then the environment is such that those denitrifying bacteria will break down the nitrate and cause it to then go off as nitrogen gas into the air or as nitrous oxide, which is another ouch because that is a greenhouse gas that is roughly 300 times more potent than, uh, than carbon dioxide for, uh, for trapping those uh, that uh, solar. So, of course, the best laid plans of mice and men, and my next slide was gonna be spending some time talking a uh, really nice schematic of the nitrogen cycle, but some, somehow <laughs> that got deleted. It was a hidden slide and then didn't show up in this presentation. So I do want you to sit back a little bit and, and think through that nitrogen recycling slide with me. And I'm gonna ask you to imagine the, the supermarket down the street or the supermarket in town. Let's call that our protein, our protein reservoir. That's our vault. That supermarket is just full of all those nutrients that we need for the plant to pick up. Now, one corner of that super, imagining this, we have maybe some urea that's coming in, a load of urea is coming in the shipping platform. That comes in, that urea comes in, and when it gets into the soil and breaks down and the amino groups cleave off, we get an ammonium ion that is formed from that urea. So there's other places we can get that ammonium ion, just the breakdown of the of some of that plant material in the or some of that uh, organic matter that's already in the supermarket. So we get some more ammonium. Now, two things can happen with that ammonium. Well, there's other things too, but two main things. One is the ammonium cation, because it's positive now, so it's a cation, can be picked up by another plant that is growing or it can be picked up or it can be converted through the nitrosomonas and nitrobacter to the nitrate form. The form, of course, is a negative, it's an anion. Both the ammonium as well as the nitrate can be picked up by plant roots, okay? And the other things that can happen with that nitrate, of course, is under the wrong conditions, anaerobic conditions, the denitrifying bacteria, cause it to leave as the ammonia, the, as the hydrogen gas or nitrous oxide. So I, I talk about that little, uh, that little supermarket because we don't have uh, my slide that I consider so important. And let's consider you and me as the plants. So we'll, we'll send our little route, we'll drive over to the supermarket, okay? And we'd like to get some ammonium or the nitrate. Now, Two ways of looking at that is the ammonium, we can go to the back of the store where we have some urea that has just come in and we'll see if our little root can get some of that ammonium out of the back of the store. It's pretty hard to get that out. That's that's tied onto the cation exchange capacity. And it's it's hard to get that, that ammonium. But the other end, back in the front of the store, front of the supermarket in the parking lot, we're sitting there in our car and, oh, here comes some water. Now some water is coming out bringing out all the pop and the liquid, and we just need to sit back in our car and absorb some of that nitrate. So it's coming into our car, or into our route as mass flow. So I wanted to sit back and think a little bit about that. The one other thing that I wanted to make a case uh, or a point of with the conversion of the ammonium to the nitrate by those little hard workers that are inside the store there, the nitrous ammonis and nitrobacter, as they convert that ammonium to nitrate, they are utilizing the hydroxyl ions of water. So what that ends up doing is, is it, it causes uh, the release of, of hydrogen ions, which is an acidifying influence in the soil. And you hear about when you're using 
uh, a lot of the urea that eventually you have to start to be concerned about acidifying uh, conditions. So that little uh, little chart that John showed with the nitrosomonas and nitrobacter and the, the production or the release of, of, of uh, phosphate, phosphate solubilization is probably coming not from the directly from the bacteria, but from an influence with the acidification. So that was the key points I wanted to make on the uh, on the nitrogen cycle. And uh, thank you for imagining that supermarket. And and now we're uh, we're back home and we're going to be continuing with the <laughs> with the uh, the webinar here. So so going on to just a little bit of some of the bio winners that are out there with commercial products. Uh, and this is biologicals that are already being being sold for uh, what they do is basically, I guess, uh, uh, biostimulants. But in this case, we're calling them bio uh, biological commercial products. Jumpstart. And apologies here, this little R and the R for serenade should be uh, a copyright symbol up in the top as a, a sub. Uh, superscript instead of a, a letter that got changed on a, on a conversion. But anyway, Penicillin bilalli is a fungal organized, organism that releases phosphate, particularly effective in soil with pH of eight or, or thereabouts because phosphate is so tied up in uh, with the calcium and magnesium at those high pHs. Best availability of phosphate is a pH of about six and a half. So now we can get penicillin bill ally that was actually working on the release of this phosphate. So that's a, a, a bio winner, actually a, a penicillin that, or a organism that was identified here at the research station in Lethbridge in the 1980s. Serenade is Bacillus subtilis. There's another name of a product or a bacteria that you see in our our uh, concoction uh, or our, our mix of bacteria in our ACF. This particular Bacillus subtilis, however, is a special strain, QST44 or 713. It is sprayed as a wettable powder. It's a product that's commercialized and sold by Bayer. It's for control of sclerotinia, pythium, powdery mildew, rhizoctonia, photophora, pink rot, Fusarium, all diseases uh, that are on the serenade label. So a post-emergent fungicide product, a bacteria that is actually working on, on fungal organisms, fungal diseases. And of course, we have not done any evaluation with ACF, SR, in terms of fungal activity, but it's certainly a possibility when you think about some of these other things that are happening with bacteria. I can't talk too long on these <laughs> these slides or my uh, my uh, little mouse locks up for the next. Anyway, let's go on. I go a little faster now here. That was to give you a lot of appreciation of what's happening in the soil. And of course, if we look at a soil profile, we see our soil horizons. Most of the roots are in that top zero to six inch or zero to 10 inch layer of soil. That's where we get the majority of all that organism uh, carrying on in terms of breaking down soil and storing the protein or sorry, storing the organic matter in that huge supermarket in the vault there that we that we call the organic matter. Chevy, you might have to advance these slides. I don't know why mine is locking up so much. But it's even more complicated in the soil. And one of the things I do is, is we teach, and I have taught for a number of years, the certified crop advisor training, which really gets into some really basic soil chemistry, uh, chemistry in the soil and water interactions. One of the easiest de definitions that we give in terms of understanding soil health is, soil health is just organic matter. It's an easy way to understand it. And of course, we know soil, Organic matter is so complex. So it's an easy definition, but it doesn't really, really mean very much, it does it. When we cultivate the soil, we're opening the oven door to the furnace. That's a term that Dr. John Dormar used at the research station many years ago. 
and it referred to the fact that when you're out cultivating a soil, you're allowing air and oxygen to get into that soil. And the more you do it, the more the, the air and the oxygen is causing mineralization of that organic matter. So the organic matter is being mined. It's been sitting there, but now we're mining it through mineralization, microorganisms that are breaking it down. And what's the net benefit, of course, is release of nutrients. And of course, nitrogen is one of the big ones. Summer follow was the old concept of farming to release nitrogen. That's back when my dad farmed in the 1950s. You grew a crop a week, the next year it was summer follow. Very common practice in the Southern prairies. It conserved water, but in addition to that, it released the nitrogen so that you didn't need to use nitrogen fertilizer the next year. Of course, we moved away from that concept. Organic matter is a very complex ecosystem. And here's some things you probably didn't know about organic matter. There is an active fraction of organic matter, a stabilized fraction and a passive fraction. The active fraction is considered to be only three to 5% of organic matter. That's where we're getting the most active release of nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, as well as other micronutrients. Half-life of three to four years. So that first, that stubble that we put into the soil, the plant residue gets converted a lot of it goes off in carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, but some of it ends up in the active fraction of organic matter. Stabilized fraction, that's the fraction of organic matter that stabilizes soil aggregates. Loss through tillage, half-life of 20 to 30 years. So that's the fraction of organic matter that we've seen deteriorate over... Uh, okay, to... I keep getting a little notes here, sorry. Stabilized fraction, that's the what we've seen the organic matter that has pretty well been lost through intensive cultivation over the last, uh, since they're in the latter, or through the 1990s, 1900s anyway. The passive fraction is 50 to 60% of organic matter. Stabilizes the soil aggregates, half-life of 150 to 1200 years. You didn't know it was that long, did you? So this, Organic matter is considered to be very important to the uh, soil aggregates and hence soil structure. And Doug Penny, I've heard him talk, he said that, that organic matter is the nails that holds the house together. Organic matter holds the soil structure together. So again, just pointing out the importance of that complex ecosystem that we call organic matter. Sheva, I'm gonna have to get, I, so just another quick little schematic here of that thing that we call soil with the uh, more of a up close view, sand, silt, clay particles. And of course, those sand particles are a thousand or 10,000 times larger than a clay particle. Those clay particles and organic matter particles, which I just indicated can be very far ranging in terms of, of types and, uh, and, and uh, types and size, that organic matter and clay have the negative have a negative charge on them. So they hold the cations, they hold that those positive charge nutrients that we have to eventually get off and get into the, the plant. Another thing to think about and here is we'll go back a little bit to our, our supermarket idea of going over there, imagining that we're a plant root, driving over in our car, We'd like to pick up some nutrients. We have three different ways that plant roots or plant roots uh, can get those nutrients. One is mass flow. So that's where we're sitting in the parking lot and here comes all the water out of the supermarket, but happens to be carrying soluble nutrients with us, which is able, easy to get into a root, easy to get into our car, because we just simply pick that up. That is the anions that are coming, the nitrate and the sulfate. So easy for, nitrate form of nitrogen to get into the plant root as long as we're picking up water. Another way that a plant root will get will get nutrients is through what's called root interception. This is now, we can't just sit in the parking lot. We've got to actually go into the supermarket with our shopping cart. Now we go to different parts of the, the supermarket and get those micronutrients that we need uh, off the shelf, a little harder to get, not as easy as with the mass flow. Kind of a little bit similar is the concept of diffusion. 
uh, where we're looking at a concentration gradient. So we're still in the supermarket now with our root, but now we have a huge amount of oranges and lemons sitting there and easy to fill our shopping cart and then go back out to the, to the car in, into our route. That's a concentration gradient. And the key elements that are picked up that way are the, uh, the uh, phosphate anion, the potassium cation, as well as zinc. So you soil scientists will and farmers will hear lots about the four R's of, of uh, fertilizers. I'm calling this the two R's of inoculants. And something to think about as we try and make these inoculants, or these bacteria uh, work for us, we are talking about the right time and the right place. So this is a little schematic that I did up uh, uh, to show the difference of, of what we have with concentration of these microorganisms that we are putting into the soil. So you can imagine certainly with the inoculants, the rhizobium that we put with legumes, we are putting an inferral with a seed. So we have concentration of that rhizobium. Or if we're doing the, uh, the ACF SR, and we put in an inferral, we have a concentration of that, that band of, of inoculant bacteria. Another way of doing it is that broadcast spray and incorporate. Now, not very effective for rhizobium inoculants, could be different with our, our ACF. We're not 100% sure in that. It certainly seems that the best way to get ACF delivered is inferral. Broadcast spray and incorporate. Now we have those bacteria all spread out. And of course, the seedlings just starting to grow. So you compare that with the possibility of putting this product on at foliar time. The crop has now emerged. Now the crop is starting to demand more and more, more and more nutrients. So now potentially, even though that bacteria is sprayed out, spread out on the soil, that inoculant, it is able to work in terms of the fact that we have more roots there. And as long as it's active and into the soil, into the moisture, it's going to be giving us the delivery that we want. What's an ACFSR? You already saw John talk about that. I highlighted a couple of them, Bacillus subtilis in terms of, of other commercial products, Nitrosomonas, Nitrobacter, extremely important in terms of, of the conversion of ammonium to the nitrate form, which is more easily picked up by the plant, as well as the fact that we're also getting some acidification and some phosphate solubilization. Do our bugs like all soil conditions? Answer not on their life. Consider this, the environment is everything to a bug. I talked about how much life is out there right now in our frozen soil. There's lots of bacteria there, but they're not doing anything, right? Temperature dependent, right? We also consider things like pH. And we know that an acidic pH of five and less, rhizobium inoculants are very ineffective. Bacteria, rhizobium like to work at a proper pH. And even some of the things we might consider with, with, uh, uh, with some of these microorganisms in a high pH soil like we have at Lethbridge, uh, are they working more effectively under that high pH or would they be more effective under a lower pH? So that's one of the things we, uh, I think uh, advanced ag will continue to look at is the best conditions for, for response. Dry soil, of course, not great. Inoculants are harmed in sunshine and heat. And, we, we know that the best way to, to, to cure a bacteria is to go outside on a nice, warm, hot, sunny day. Soil health, just again, what are, we, what are things in that soil? What's the organic matter? If it's an 8% organic matter, then we have, what, 160 tons of organic matter in an acre slice compared to a 2% organic matter where we'd have only 40 tons of organic matter in that acre slice. So the amount of organic matter is certainly gonna be uh, a big consideration with our bug and our bug life. Let's go on to, just before I talk about our research results, just a bit of a review on statistics. And I call this confidence in research data. So a bit of a review, some of you will be familiar with this. When you look at data and the uh, uh, 
replicated trials, we always look at, at a analysis of variance. That's the amount of variability so uh, that is occurring from one rep to another. And we like to see a lot of consistency. So the treatment effect in one rep is the same treatment effect in, that we're seeing in the other. So we can analyze just how good those uh, repetition of data is from one rep to another by doing a statistical analysis of variance. And you probably have heard this before, numbers, means, in other words, means are followed by the, the same digit are not significantly different. But if they're followed by a different digit, then they are significantly different than the means that's followed by a different digit or a different, uh, uh, yeah, I guess we'll call them digits. So there are different types of analysis that we can use too. We can use the least significant difference, LSD, Tukey's is another, another statistical analysis. It's considered one of the most stringent. In fact, the joke is with Tukey's, you do an analysis of uh, variance with that, it's time tough to even find a significant difference from your mother. So that's pretty, that's pretty tough. So if we go back to the field uh, situation in agriculture where we, we're generally dealing with maybe a 10% variation uh, with variability in the field, and that's probably on a good situation. If we use something like a 5% confidence, so that means that, that if those numbers are significantly different, the A's and the B's, then you're winning 95 times out of 100. Or if you're using a different significant level, P equal 0.2, which is 20% significant, then that means you're going to win if those, those digits, the abbreviated letters are there. Uh, I guess they're letters, not digits. If the letters are, are an A and a B, then you're winning four times out of five. So that's pretty good in agriculture when you think about a biostimulant. We could probably get away with a little less stringent analysis of variance to help us understand whether we're getting a, a good response. So here's a stats example at the bottom where we have four treatments, a mean of one, treatment one is 10 with a little uh, abbreviation letter A, 12 is an AB, 14 is a BC, 16 is a C. So very clearly we can say 16, letter C is significantly different than 10, significant, which is letter A. 12 is not significantly different than, than, uh, than 10 because it's followed by, there's two A's there. Uh, 12 is significantly different, however, than 16. So that's the process you go through when you're looking at replicated data and the reason for replicated data. I'm gonna get you to continue to, to, to go through these slides for me, Sheva. So going on to our yield results with ham and ag research here outside of Lethbridge, the one crop that doesn't seem to respond is canola. And that's in three years of kind of looking at it. It's a little bit of variability there. We get a, a hunch that it's, we're seeing some result, but canola roots release a vapam type fumigant, or maybe it's the glucosinolates that they're in the root. So whatever, we know other fungal organisms like mycorrhizae don't like canola roots either. So there are some limitations with some of that plant, some of those crops that we're growing. Yield results from peas. Here's a site, a low fertility site. And when I say low fertility, I'm generally talking low nitrogen, low phosphates. We added uh, a fertilized check. So we had pretty good fertility in it when it was done with the seed. But when we compare that fertilized check, had it with fertilized check plus added ACF broadcast and incorporated at two US gallons per acre, we got an increase in yield from three three bushels an acre, significantly different. So that said that we had pretty good stats, pretty good coefficient of variation in the trial. We looked at in furrow with seed. We got a little bit higher number there, again, significantly different than our, our check. And foliar with a pivot running, again, even a little bit better in terms of number, but all those three treatments were not significantly different than each other, but were from the check. Barley, let's move on to barley. Again, a low fertility site. 
lower in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus going into the year. We did add substantial uh, fertilizer in terms of our fertilized check up in the 80 pounds of N per acre. Uh, again, the yield, not quite you would expect or want with a really, uh, really excellent yield in barley and under, under irrigation, but 77 bushels per acre. Broadcasting incorporated, we did not get a significant difference. In furrow with the seed, 81 bushels an acre. Uh, we did not get a, a significant increase. And pivot to running. Uh, okay, so the trend was, I guess my point is here, although we don't see a significant increase in yield, the conclusion is it becomes the... Although there is no significant difference in yield, the uh, treatments all tended to yield higher than the check by one to five bushels an acre. So you'd go back to the coefficient of variation and just see how uniform that those reps were. And I can't see that bottom part of my slide here. Uh, it was, it's cut off. Next slide. Yield results with wheat. Again, we did not see the significant difference. Uh, in terms of yield compared to the fertilized check. Pretty low, pretty low yield for wheat under irrigation, but considering low fertile soil, and we could even have things like maybe some of the micronutrients are, are actually impacting here and uh, minimizing the response that we expect. But nonetheless, a tendency, uh, the treatment number three in furrow with seed at two US gallon per acre, tending to yield higher than the untreated check. Next, yield results with barley. This is a, a irrigated site with high fertility. So now we actually have, uh, the letters are reversed here a little bit, but nonetheless, our fertilizer check and our in furrow with a seed uh, C, the treatment split in furrow with ACF furrow follow-up post-emergent 128, significantly higher yield than the fertilized check and the inferral. And broadcast even with the pivot running when we're getting a little more growth there and then trying to incorporate the bacteria with some, some irrigation, also showing a uh, significant increase over the untreated, which the untreated fertilized check. So just to be clear, all those other those treatments had the same fertilized check. The difference was we just had ACF going along with the fertilized check at the same rate. Next. Yield results with peas, uh, irrigated high fertility. Here's where I said, do we usually see a result with peas? But in fact, with this high, high uh, fertility site and humongous yield with peas here, even with our fertilized check, uh, we were not seeing a significant increase in yield. But nonetheless, probably masked by the fact that we have such a high yield there, there could be some little micronutrient that ends up impacting the entire trial. So do we win all the time? No, and that's part of what we're trying to identify with advanced ag is what are the conditions that give us the best response. Next, P yields in 2018 and 2019. So here now I uh, represent the results with 2018, our fertilized check. Here, these were under a high fertility field situation, not quite the yield that we had in that previous uh, chart, but 79, and we went up to, 84 with the inferral and even a little higher with the inferral plus the foliar in crop. Our fertilized check in 2019, 86, but again, nice yield increase with the uh, treatments inferral or in the inferral followed up sequential with a post emergent. Next. Barley yields, we didn't see quite the response we saw with peas. However, we did tend to see in 2018 a yield increase with the inferral, uh, 2019. And again, it goes back to a lot of times there's things that happen uh, at harvest time that all of a sudden can impact the trial a little bit. Just part of the, the vari variation and the in fact impact of, of field conditions when we're, we're trying to do as, as close a control uh, trial as possible. Next one. Canola yields, and there again, where we looked at 2018, 2019, we just didn't see the difference in treatments that we saw, especially with peas and somewhat with barley. 
Next. Core Ag, this is some results from up in the Strathmore area, and this was provided to me by Advanced Ag. Uh, a nice trial here in terms of yield response. I don't have the stats on this, but it was done by Small Plot Research in conjunction with Premium Ag and, and Core Ag. And you see those yields increasing from the fertilized check up through some pretty significant increases, uh, 51, 53, 57, as we looked at the treatments. Uh, barley, nice response again as well. 102, 104, okay, maybe the last one in furrow, 115 is a, tended to be a much higher than the untreated check. Uh, wheat, nice yield increase. Again, I don't know the stats on these this particular trial, but tended to yield higher than the fertilized check. And canola in this case, actually looking pretty good as well. Oh, sorry, that bottom line is actually four US gallons. So that's that's twice uh, what treatment two is. And, and as Josh pointed out, when he handed me this information, it actually looks like there's a, a bit of a yield, uh, yield response with going to a higher rate of that particular ACF, uh, that treatment. Next. So just summary of our ham and ag research trials. Peas have shown the biggest response to ACF SR. Barley and wheat have shown response. ACF in soil, uh, limited fertility seems to have the best response in our trials. So when I say limited, it could be just a, a bit of a shortage going in the year. You still uh, go in with full rate of fert fertilizer, but it looks like the ACF is just able to, to respond a little better when we're entering the year already with somewhat of a shortage. Next. 2021 research, uh, one of the things we're going to do is I'm working on a project uh, with the Protein Cluster Initiative. It's actually the Protein Protein Industry Canada and uh, ACF is going to be one of the partners along with Ham and Ag Research uh, in this research grant application uh, where we're going to look at and assess, uh, assess and develop the opportunities for innovative plant and soil biologicals for yield, for percent protein, thousand seed weight and protein quality of yellow peas. And certainly there's been an initiative in Canada here uh, as, we, as we look at the uh, desire for human uh, non-animal based protein to look at extraction plants. So this is part of what we're looking at here with this particular project, uh, looking for influence of these uh, of bio, of our bio products in terms of how it might impact protein. And I think uh, uh, Travis already mentioned, he's pretty convinced in his trials, he's getting an increase in protein. So that would be a great, a great aspect of the ACF product going forward as well. Next. So summary and farmer trials, Scotty Data Walker will review. I would suggest if you wanna try your own trial, uh, target peas, wheat or barley first, and remember, ACFSR is a specialized bacterial blend. So treat it like something that could be damaged. Treat it like an inoculant. If it could be damaged by heat, sun, or dry conditions, try and minimize them. Use only one or two treatments and compare the yield to the check. So don't get a big fancy trial out there when you're doing strip trials. Keep it simple so it's easy to measure and effect. 